There is work to be done. Fences that need mending. Communities that need rebuilding. And there are places we still must go. Some of these places are physical. Some aren't. Wherever your journey takes you, know this. We make our boots for you. Here in Jämtland, we are surrounded by beautiful mountains, deep forests, and magical, colorful lakes. One of our favorite seasons of the year is autumn, when the colors of the mountains change from green to an explosion of red and yellow, a time when the air is crisp and the snow starts to fall. No matter where you are or what you are doing, our garments will keep you warm. Hello everyone, I'm Robert McFarlane and I'm the patron of the Kendall Mountain Literature Festival. This is a message to welcome you all from wherever you are in the world to our online festival this year. We've got more than 30 literature events for you and you can tune into them from the comfort of your own home or garden or from a riverbank, from a mountaintop, wherever you choose to watch us from. We're here. And the events will stay online on demand until the end of the year. The theme of this year's festival is nurture, care, care for yourself, care for the communities you're part of, and of course, care for the living world, the nurture of nature that's done so much for us to lift our hearts and help our spirits in this hardest of years. So folks, it's story time. Grab a cup of tea, settle back, and enjoy the show. Hello everybody and welcome to the Kendall Mountain Literature Festival, proudly presented by Dana and supported by Wallpower and George Fisher. My name's Anita Sethi, I'm a writer and journalist and I'm absolutely thrilled to be chairing this event with the wonderful Lucy Jones who's going to be discussing her excellent new book, Losing Eden. The book was described by Isabella Tree, author of Wilding. It's beautifully written, movingly told, and meticulously researched, a convincing plea for a wilder, richer world. Today many of us live indoors, disconnected from the natural world, more than ever before, yet nature remains deeply ingrained in our language, culture and con consciousness. And we're going to be talking to Lucy more about her wonderful new book. And welcome Lucy, so great to Thank have you so here. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to, to and see I wanted to chatting with you. I wanted to start first by asking about the wonderful title, Losing Eden. And the <laughs> loss informs the book in beautiful um, ways, including personal loss, but also this loss of nature and how it affects us all. Yeah, sure. Um, the book, was, the working title of the book, actually, for quite a number of years was um, Greenpeace. Um, and obviously that wasn't gonna gonna work because of Greenpeace. But um, the the title "Losing Eden" kind of came quite late in the process. Um, and I remember I think I suggested it to my editor, and I kind of had a panic because I thought, oh, it, it's maybe a bit too depressing. But actually, you know, looking back on it now, I think it, it is the right title for the book because, as much as kind of my inquiry and, and the investigation. Um, that's in Losing Eden is kind of trying to discover how and why nature affects our mental health. Um, you know, I, I quickly found that I, I couldn't write a book about that without um, very much writing about the fact we live in a, a world of wounds um, and a, a nature depleted country in Britain and that ecological loss um, is is affecting our mental health just as much as the kind of positive therapeutic benefits. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So yeah, losing Eden, it, 
it, it did it does feel like the right the right title because I suppose when I kind of connected again with nature, which was the genesis of the book, I think this is quite common for people um, if they've had a long dormancy period that then they reconnect and then they realise kind of what's happened and what's happening and and then with that can come kind of ecological grief or climate dread and so on and those are, are very much you know imp impact on the psyche as much as those positive benefits mm -hmm. and um, i love how you interweave the personal with the political for example flagging up how david cameron disparagingly used the green crap to describe environmental issues was that something that you found um, was an organic thing, that kind of weaving of the personal and political? Yeah, I think um, and it, it all kind of began with this personal epi epiphany, I guess. And you know, I think a lot, a lot of people probably, um, you know, and most people maybe intuitively know that spending time in the natural world um, yeah. can help us manage mental health conditions or kind of mm. buoy us up and so on and provide stress restoration but when um i was going through this personal experience of um ill health and, and recovery from depression and addiction um i found walking daily in walthamstow marshes and and, and reconnecting with the rest of the living world um so so deeply therapeutic and helpful kind of as as helpful as the um, mm. medicine and, and psychotherapy that I was using but what was I think interesting to me at that point was how um, how surprising that was um, and how you know as much as we have this kind of idea that you know in Britain we're a kind of nature loving country that it was a real surprise to me that nature could be so therapeutic um, which kind mm. of started the investigation um, so bringing in that personal uh, section at the beginning just kind of felt like the the right way to introduce this, what was kind of mm -hmm. driving my journey. Um, but then, of course, you can't really write about the natural world and our environment without bringing in the political because, you know, I look around at the town that I live in now and, you know, the natural spaces are being um, built over uh, you know, we don't prioritise nature in our society and in, in so many different spectrums. So, it, you know, it, it felt natural to me to kind of look at society and, and politics and so on policy, um, because those are the some of the obstacles and barriers which prevent people from accessing the full stress relieving properties of, of nature. Mm -hmm so beautifully and movingly about how the natural world helps you personally at your lowest ebb um, with, with mental ill health. So I wanted to ask you more about that and your journey there because you write so engagingly about growing up in Thames Valley and how nature wasn't very cool and that you were more interested in Radiohead than wildlife and spent most of your time drinking and to, to talk me through that journey and about how when you were aged 17 and you first began experiencing mental ill health? Yeah, um, I guess um, I, I had quite a kind of turbulent adolescence, as, as lots of people do. Um, and I definitely didn't have a kind of relationship with, with, with nature at, at that point beyond kind of watching the latest Attenborough documentaries and so on. Um, and and kind of, yes, started drinking quite a lot as a teenager and then I know I first experienced depression in my late teens. Um, and that has kind of, I've had episodes of depression since. Um, um, probably the most major one was the one in my mid twenties, which is what kind of sparks mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the recovery involved with nature, which, which led to losing Eden. Um, and, I guess in a way it kind of it, it kind of goes back to what I, I was saying before I think you know as a teenager going through you know things teenagers go through and then you know depression anxiety later which many people go through as well um I never going to, into nature for 
kind of stress relief or to calm my nervous system or to quieten the rumination and brooding uh, in my brain, all, all these things which now science is kind of shedding light on and explaining um, in terms of that mechanism between nature and our minds. None of, none of those things were kind of apparent to me and, and so instead I, I became quite a, well I was, I was self-medicating self with, with alcohol. Um, and then I suppose in a way it was, it was kind of when I got, when I got really quite unwell, I was really desperate. I knew that exercise was good for you if you were, um, if your, if your mind felt like it was breaking. Um, so I started going running and walking, but it wasn't, I, I ended up kind of walking more than running because I wanted to look at the trees and the birds and, and, um, the insects in Walthamstow marshes um and I think one of the one of the moments which which I write about in Losing Eden which also kind of I think encapsulates both the positive benefits of nature but also this loss was um I was living in this flat in Hackney in East London and I was I think about a year sober or so and it'd been really difficult to get sober and um learn how to live a so kind of sober life and I had this beautiful pear tree outside our bedroom window and it was a really urban environment we were quite far from you know more than 10 minute walk from a green space and I grew to really rely on this pear tree and it and it kind of symbolized change and growth and um you know the fact that things kind of move and continue and, and I kind of fastened my hope to that um and um the neighbors were doing some building and they covered the pear tree in scaffolding um and uh i was i suddenly got very anxious and kind of i felt really wired and caged and kind of unhappy and and that the experience of that kind of freaked me out a bit i was a little embarrassed i was like how could this tree have such an effect um and and that kind of made me look around myself and think you know is this is our disconnection from nature you know as a as a society which is unprecedented um harming our minds in some way or at least um preventing us from from kind of sanity um and then today in terms of kind of mental health um, I don't see connecting with nature as an, as an indulgence or as a waste of time. It is um, really important for my day, part, part of my kind of day to day sanity. Um, you know, this year, probably like lots of people, perhaps more than ever, um, I have had periods of postnatal depression over the last few years, and there have been moments where. Um, I have felt nothing in nature because, you know, my spirits have been completely flat, but it, it always returns. And now I see it as, you know, eating vegetables or getting a good night's sleep. It's kind of, um, it's like a non-negotiable part of, part of my day. And as well as telling this incredibly moving personal story about your own, own journey through alcoholism, addiction and recovery, you also combine the most fascinating cutting edge research. And I wanted to ask um, two things. First, firstly, about your research process, because you, you know, you take us on this absolutely thrilling journey through history, really, from, you know, the historical thinking about our connection between nature and well-being, right up to the contemporary age, you know, speaking to um, traveling from forest schools in East London, to the Svalbard Global Seed Vault via prim primeval woods, Californian laboratories and ecotherapists couch. So I wanted to ask if you could talk us through some of that research and also then se second secondarily um, about the challenges of kind of like balance, because you so beautifully balance, you know, your own personal story with research, but we'll come back to that a little bit later on, but just to think about. So Firstly, um, I would love for you to tell me about your research process and some of the amazing things you discovered along the way. Sure, thank you. Yeah, with pleasure. Um, so I was really lucky that um, I had this kind of personal epiphany and then I was 
really driven to um, work out how and why nature was um, so therapeutic. What was it doing to my brain? What was it doing to my body? How was it affecting my nervous system? Um, I was working uh, as a science journalist mostly at the time, mostly for the BBC. And I guess because of my kind of internal curiosity and bias, I'd often end up interviewing some, uh, some kind of scientist and then I, we'd end up talking about climate change and the climate crisis, obviously. And then um, we might end up talking about kind of the connection with nature and mental health. And it quickly became apparent to me that there was this really uh, exciting and vibrant um, research field um, where scientists across the world, from neuroscientists to environmental psychologists, um, forest bathing um, scientists to uh, endocrinologists were trying to answer the question that I, I, I was wanting to answer too and drill down mm -hmm. into the kind of the nuts and bolts and the nitty gritty. Um, yeah. So yes, we all kind of intuit maybe that being in nature might make us feel in some way good, but what does that mean? What does looking at um, kind of the fractal shapes of a plant or a flower do to our mm. brain chemistry? What does listening to birdsong do to our stress, our cortisol levels? Um, so as soon as I started kind of researching, I was, I was like just blown away by the fact there were all these conferences across the world. There was already a kind of couple of decades of literature um, going back to one of the seminal studies is by this guy Roger Ulrich and it's called A View from a Window. Um, such a simple, beautiful title for something quite major, which is that he found that patients recovering from surgery would recover quicker and have um, kind of better mood and less side effects um, from medication if they were looking onto um, a tree rather than a, a brick wall. So, um, so, so it was good timing. It was really fortuitous timing to kind of start the research journey and, you know, realize that lots of really exciting scientists were, were trying to answer the same question. Um, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned um, history and there was quite a lot of research and reading kind of in the hinterland of the book in terms of, um, obviously kind of my perspective on nature is is a kind of um is culturally influenced by you know growing up in this country the romantic poets um always living in urban areas and so on um living in the post-industrial revolution um so quite a lot of i was i was kind of trying to you know read and, and understand Kind of more of a kind of long time relationship with nature and and i suppose within that was the question of how much of our kind of affiliation or um the effect of nature on us today is kind of a cultural influence you know the construct of nature as this kind of healing balm and this place that we visit to, to feel better or how much of it is a kind of intrinsic, innate um, part of life that we all need. Um, and to look at that, I was particularly interested in the biophilia hypothesis, um, yeah, which is the biological. Yeah, I was going to about that. So thank you for taking us there. Because um, that's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Even the work. So tell us more for those who, listening who don't know much about this absolutely fascinating word, biophilia. Yeah, sure. So. Um, E.O. Wilson is a kind of eminent American uh, biologist and one of his mm -hmm. um, uh, kind of most important books is Biophilia um, and, and in it he argues this, this hypothesis, the biophilia hypothesis, which is that because um, humans spent 99% of our evolutionary history in nature, um, so, you know, snakes mattered, uh, the the sun mattered, the direction of, you know, a stalk mattered, the shape of a tree mattered. Um, we have this uh, kind of innate genetic affiliation and kind of inbuilt um, love for living things and for the natural world. Um, and so he argues in this book um, that 
humans have a kind of genetic need kind of on a cellular level to have be in kind of relation and and be be in nature um and that that book has kind of has very much influenced thought since that point um like biophilic architecture biophilic design um it kind of uses uses those ideas um and i you know it, it was very compelling to me and um and it in, in terms it kind of kind of informed the way I looked at kind of humanity and nature, which is obviously a massive subject. And often in the research yeah. process, just to go back to your original question, I thought, yeah. what am I doing? How can I write about such a big, big subject? And I do feel yeah. that I, um, you know, there's there are a million books could be read, written on this subject, and I and I and I finished it with more questions, and um, I guess. Um, it was, yeah, the research process was, it involved a bit of travel. So you mentioned Svalbard. Um, yeah. And that was, that was a wonderful trip to the Arctic, which is kind of like the nearest wilderness mm -hmm. really to, mm -hmm. um, to, to, to England. And um, I wanted to visit the seed vault there, which seemed to me like a kind of symbol of, where we were heading um, as a world, you know, that we have to create this doomsday vault in the side of a mountain to store seeds mm -hmm. for safekeeping, you know, in the face of ecocide or nuclear war or so on. Um, mm -hmm. And and I wanted to go to um, Bielowieża Forest in in Poland, um, which was kind of the oldest ancient primeval woodland in in Europe. And that was being logged again kind of felt like a symbol of you know as much as we say we love nature and uh clearly we have overlooked and we're forgetting and we're ignoring the fact that we need um the natural world not just for our life support systems or because it should be protected just in for itself not for, just for us but for our sanity um as well mm. And thank you so much. And those tra travels were absolutely fascinating. You really so vividly took us on the journey with with you. And like during this time of lockdown, it's just been wonderful to show how much books can actually, you know, take us on journeys when we can't go anywhere ourselves. So I, I just wanted to say so, so powerfully done. Um, That's you, so you talked fine. about Thanks how so each. Much. My pleasure. And um, you talked about how, you know, the question seems to raise further questions. Some of the questions at the heart of this book include how and why does nature make us feel good? How does it affect human mental health? And how can it ameliorate psychological pain? And I loved how you, you know, raise that issue of psychological pain because there's, there's not much, there's not huge amounts written about it and how, you know, psychological pain can be ameliorated by connection with nature so take, tell us more about that and what did you learn about that um, during the course of your research yeah sure um so i mean i i mean i guess there's a spectrum isn't there to psychological pain um mm. all of us feel it at some point and you know kind of from the um kind of everyday sense you know we all have good days and bad days and um the research showed that um kind of on both a individual level and a population level being in closer proximity with green space uh trees nature water and so on um equates to better mental health in communities um, and individuals um, and just to break that down a bit, so that's so we're talking about things like um, if we spend time in a in a, a natural area, our nervous systems are more likely to be balanced. So studies show that um, the parasympathetic nervous system is more likely to be triggered if we're in a natural area, so mm. by the sea or a river or in a forest or so on, and that means um, the the, the nervous system that is involved in kind of rest and digest and repair, as opposed to the sympathetic nervous system, which is um, 
the one that we don't want to be on too much because it's uh, it's fight or flight and it and it kind of and it leads to stress. So in terms of our nervous systems, if we're in kind of psychological stress, um, going into a natural space, we're more likely to have the the side of the nervous system that you want activated. Yeah. Um, and then within that, you have um, the effect of kind of bird song or um, the smells of nature as well, impacting on the different stress chemicals in the body. Um, one of my favourite um, studies was a, about petrichor, uh, which is the smell oh, yes. of that the earth. Yeah, yeah mm. the smell of the earth after it's rained, which is, you know, that really kind of metallic, kind of ferric. Yeah. Um, beautiful smell and obviously like you know lots of us like it you can get candles and perfume and petrichor but did you know that um studies show that it activates areas of the brain associated with relaxation and calmness um so scientists um hypothesize that you know because for the 99 percent of our our history um, being able to smell and be attuned to that that chemical because it would have meant water um, mm-hmm. has led to you know it, it, even today having a, an effect on our brains um, and then there's the I think that the theory um, there's stress recovery theory and there's also attention restoration theory which was developed by um, the environmental psychologist, the Kaplan's, and that um, kind of speaks to me and resonates to me a lot, actually. And and it basically says that when we're in a natural space, um, the cognitive kind of side of our brains has, is allowed uh, the chance to kind of restore and rest. And one of the elements of that is soft fascination. Um, wow. And so that could be something like a you know, the leaves of a tree moving in a breeze or um, or waves kind of moving. You know that point when you're, you know, sometimes you might just look out a window and you're kind of in a bit of a trance looking at a moving tree or or um, rainwater yeah. falling on river or so on, so on. And it kind of feels like you're giving your brain a, a break. So it's a, it's a break from directed attention, you know, all the things that we have to do in, in the modern world. Um, so those are just a few examples of kind of mm. how what the science is telling us about how nature can just affect our wellness. Um, yeah. And of course, you have things like light and circadian rhythms and how important that is. And then um, one of my other favourite areas was the science of awe, which is a relatively new science. But, mm. you know, I you think, I mean, I certainly thought, oh, awe, cool. I mean, yeah, it's great to feel awe. Oh, the science of awe, um, yes. It's a, it's a fascinating history, isn't it? Awe. Yeah. So tell me more about actually, that. Because we could all do with a bit more awe in our lives at the moment, yeah. Absolutely, we could. And, you know, the effects of awe are kind of mind-blowing. Um, so there's this guy called Dasha Keltner who has a lab. Um, yeah in California and and he's been studying the science of awe for a couple of decades um, and it turns out that uh, awe as opposed to any other positive emotion can lower um, inflammation biomarkers so that's cytokines which are um, chemicals in the body which um, lead to inflammation which you know you don't want um, so it has an actual physiological biological um, potential effect on us not only that um experiencing awe can make people kinder and more generous um so this lab did some studies where um they i think they dropped a load of pens one of on the floor and the the mm-hmm. group who'd been looking at kind of awe inducing pictures were more likely to help pick up the pens um wow. or in another study share the winnings of a lottery prize Mm. um so i think that there was just so there was so much going on in this this field which um was fascinating and just shed light on this relationship Mm. between nature Mm. and mind it's so complex uh and rich and diverse you know just as people are diverse and just as nature is diverse um 
but just to answer to your question about psychological pain um moving into the kind of more extreme end of that i had a kind of assumption as i was w writing and researching that um nature-based therapies wouldn't touch the sides of the more more severe mental illnesses um i kind of i had a kind of black presumption that they would be good for people suffering from depression or anxiety or um or so on but but could they really help people who were, were much more severely unwell and that led me to visiting a um medium secure unit um where i yeah, sat down so in this, yeah i sat down in this kind of horticultural mm -hmm. therapy area with i mean probably the most unwell people i've, I've ever interviewed and what the horticultural therapist said has always stayed with me and she said you know if people are seriously unwell if you if you stop them having contact with the, the natural world and, and the living world they'll get even even more sick um and because of that you know horticultural therapy has always been ring fenced and protected in terms of funding um in prisons and hospitals and so on um so, and I mean, it's a complicated area, obviously, the nature-based interventions, the social prescribing, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot more GPs and so on starting to prescribe nature. Um, it's a complex area. But I think, mm. I think the, the, the main point I felt kind of through the journey was that um, it was interest, it's interesting that we have to have nature prescribed to us or recommended to us. We have become so disconnected that it's, you know, it, mm. we're kind of over, we're overlooking how crucial contact with the natural world is for our minds. Absolutely, yeah. And you wrote um, a brilliant piece in the Guardian during lock, earlier in the year during lockdown about how lockdown has, you know, shown us all just how crucial it cr crucial nature is for our well being and mental health. How when you know when we were in this absolutely extraordinary time that we're living through in the, in the during the pandemic, when we have been only allowed to leave the house, we were only allowed to leave the house for, you know, to go for a walk. So tell me more about that and how, how the pandemic age has shown us even more the subjects at the heart of your book. Yeah, sure. I mean, it was kind of, it's strange to release a book two weeks before kind of a pandemic hits. Um, yeah. I think, I mean, on a personal level, I found, I kind of, I found that that one hour walk every day, um, which I took with my family, um, was very, very uh, important. Um, and kind of anecdotally, obviously, we've heard a lot from people who've been suffering kind of immense grief and loneliness and how people have found um, kinship and, and companionship uh in in the living world um and reconnecting with it you know all my um neighbors their front gardens have been turned into vegetable patches and you know, oh, people lovely. people um buying bird feeders and planting seeds and i think that you know that speaks to um to kind of a human need to to connect and and, and it, it's a kind of i guess growing and planting is a kind of act of psychological resistance isn't it I write about the um, yes. um, the First World War in in losing Eden and how yeah. soldiers and yeah. internees kind of grew, uh, gardened in the trenches and so on. Um, but I think so. So we heard kind of anecdotally about you know people being drawn again and finding comfort uh, in in the spring. The spring was um, such a beautiful spring. But then I think the evidence and the data later on has backed that up. Um, in different surveys we've we've learned that you know people were happier if they were going into the natural world and so on um i mean i think that i guess for a lot of people this year um grief and loneliness has been has been has been present and um one of the things that uh the chief druid who i interviewed for losing eden said mm. to me which resonated a lot and has since is that if you're kind of in relationship with with the rest of nature you're you're never truly alone um 
you know, you're never truly kind of on your own. Um, and, you know, from what I've kind of heard and read, that has been that has been a comfort for, for people um, in, in all ways, as it kind of always has. You know, we've got lots of, um, we've got, as, as much as Losing Eden was about the science of nature and mental health, um, you know, nature for so many people is a metaphorical, um, spiritual, numinous, or, you know, kind of, like there's an imminence to, to, to nature, which is sometimes hard to explain and beyond words. But definitely when I was interviewing ecotherapists who you know, were counselling people at different stages of their lives, um, there's something about the kind of symbolism of nature, isn't, isn't there? The, mm. the assurance that the dawn will come, the assurance that the spring will come and the mushrooms will push through in autumn and... Um, you know, it seems that when there was much, there wasn't very many stress busting activities people could do or restore restoration uh, opportunities that turning into those kind of patterns and beauty as well, you know, beauty and color and, and so on has really helped people. And I just hope that um, that's something that we can, you know, bring through into the, the next stage of the world mm. absolutely here's hoping um as the world rebuilds itself post-pandemic uh, hopefully post-pandemic yeah sorry i just yes. totally interrupted no go you. on but i want i Please think do. It's, um, um i think the i guess probably the the main thing that the pandemic and kind of nature connection in this country showed us is um like the injustice of inequality of access to the natural yes, world absolutely yeah. so yeah. um people living in flats with no access to gardens or parks were denied the um restorative benefits of nature um i write about this uh, in losing eden you know we know that kind of the more affluent areas have more higher quality green spaces um more deprived areas have less less access you know, and there are kind of lots of barriers and obstacles um, mm. to, to nature uh, in our society. Um, you know, from the fact that the cars dominate our towns and children can't play to um, people experiencing racism and uh, exclusion in, in natural environments. Mm -hmm. um, and I think mm -hmm. that the pandemic really shone a light on that, um, that, you know, there is environmental injustice in this country um and it's not just a kind of um it's not just a kind of environmental injustice it's actually a public health crisis you know the, the more we know yeah. about how important nature is for people's mental health and physical health the more it's a stain on our society that it's not equitable um across across the country Absolutely. Thank you so much for raising that point because it is hugely important. And we've seen how, you know, coronavirus is actually linked to air pollution and those living in highly polluted inner cities are obviously dying at higher rates. And it's just the link between you know, how the, the air we breathe is affected by things like class and regionality and so on. So thank you for raising that. Exactly. So, um, Lucy, you are telling me about the absolutely beautiful structure of your book. It is structured. Um, it is structured like a tree with the parts seedling, roots, branches, trunk, bark, snag, future nature. And I would love to hear about how you came up with this ingenious structure. And um, then if we could talk through a, in a nutshell, each of those parts, as it were. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. I'm glad you like the structure. Um, so um yeah the the actual tree framing device came came quite late it came at the end um um it was quite a it, it took a while to get the structure right of the book um i mean in a way it was kind of like it was a real journey writing the book because um like at the beginning it was it was very much all about um you know the science behind um nature and mental health but then even in my mm. kind of proposal i'd put down 
I want to go to Svalbard, to the seed vault. I want to go to Poland, to this forest that's being logged. And um, it took a while for me to realise that I was really interested in flipping that question of, um, you know, not just how does nature kind of help our mental health, but how does our disconnection from nature um, damage our mental health? So, so yeah, the structure took a while to kind of um, materialise. Um, my brilliant editor, Helen Conford, um, suggested to me in one of the edits that I write it according to, um, I don't know if I'm giving away any of her secrets here, but Seven Ages of Man, the kind of Shakespearean, um, I can't remember what play, play it's from, but um, it's kind of like infant soldier. It goes through the kind of Seven Ages of Man. And, um, yeah. And that was just quite a kind of interesting exercise and kind of, I don't know, playing with it a little bit. And then um, I guess uh, I guess the tree framing um, seemed um, to work in a number of ways. Uh, you know, one being the fact that bath trees are awesome, obviously, and there's a lot of tree uh, tree kind of science in the book. Um, but there's also something, you know, I think that we all, um, well, many of us kind of resonate or are drawn to trees. There's something, I don't know, um, you can kind of relate to a tree as a human, maybe. I mean, it's the kind of the yes, seed so and the way it grows. Yeah. You know, even, and I don't, I, there's that amazing um, stat, isn't there, that we share kind of, 90% of our genes with trees you know, even though they're not um yes. yeah. they're not animals there's you know, that yeah. for, for many years humans have um have kind of related to them and um and I suppose you know the the way it's structured the seedling and the roots and the trunk that was also mirroring um I was also watching my baby grow through the um through oh, the writing of it yeah. as well yes, so it kind yeah. of um, mirrored that um and then yeah the the snag which is the part six of the book which is the the word for a kind of a, a dead tree a dying tree dead wood um felt like quite a kind of an not an interesting concept because um you know dead wood's really important and you look at a, a dead tree and you think it's dead and there's nothing happening, but actually, you know, they're really important um, habitats for all manner of different species. Um, and I quite liked kind of ending on that and thinking about the fact mm, that we, absolutely. it feels like we're coming to the end of um, some kind of, um, you know, historic moment. You know, we're living at the most ecologically destructive uh, time ever in history uh, and a time of great inequality as well um but th from this moment from this kind of um rubble uh hopefully something can kind of come out of it and and i wanted to end with future nature on um yeah, a few absolutely. of the kind of um yeah a few of the kind of inspiring and um yeah kind of radical um ac actions and visions that i was kind of seeing which things like um wild law so this is this idea of earth um jurisprudence that you know clearly the way our society is structured is not sufficient in protecting the natural world um mm -hmm. so like i said earlier I, I live in a town at the moment where just all the natural spaces are being developed on and, and so on and you know nature is so in the margins of our of our world but wild law and earth jurisprudence which um which is uh is popular in countries like uh bolivia for example um and argentina i think it's this idea that if you put you can protect mountains or rivers or trees in yes. the courts of law um mm. giving them personhood um so mm. i wanted to, to kind of write about that and then um biophilic cities so I, I look at um, Detroit and, and Singapore, examples of um, highly urban areas, you know, which we're all going to be living in at some, well, the vast majority of people by 2050 will be 
in an urban area area but how can um how can the cities be structured in order to let the natural world flourish mm. and thrive um instead of kind of being pushed pushed out and destroyed um so i looked at kind of tree defenders in sheffield um mm. and and kind of areas where like detroit detroit was an interesting one because um you know it has such a kind of unjust history but through kind of rewilding the city almost there's been a kind of um impact both on kind of the nature in, in this urban area but also the community so how how living in a more harmonious societies with the natural world can actually help our communities and that's something that i've found actually this year i've been rewilding a patch of lawn outside oh, my house with with um with my neighbors and it's the first time i've ever really oh, done fantastic. anything like that and it's been very um it's been really empowering and and kind of i don't know yeah not a nice sense of community so um mm. i wanted to end with on a positive note as much as possible but mm. in the end i do call for um a new relationship um with the earth which sounds like a really ridiculously grand and simple thing to say but um you know it's it's dysfunctional at the moment and the time is running out um i think education is really important in that and you know, i look at forest schools and so on um but i try i try and set out what it could look could look like um yeah and um, yeah thank you so much well it's all absolutely fascinating and we just before we we have a couple more minutes before we have to go um and i wanted to we talked about the future i just wanted to delve back a little bit more into your past and ask about um your writing journey like did you always want to be a writer as a as a in childhood as well or is there a moment that you decided that you discovered your love of words and you knew that you wanted to do this for a living because i know that you combine writing books with journalist as well um yeah i think i I, I did from a, a young age I was always writing stories and like terrible poetry um and I've always been like a, a you know massive reader I don't think I ever truly like believed I could be a writer or could write a book like it always seemed like not something within my reach but um so I still I kind of pinch myself um but I do I think kind of um, personally, I'm quite shy and self-conscious and I find mm. it quite difficult to um, yeah. talk and articulate myself. Um, so I've always found writing just to be very important in terms of um, uh, expressing myself and making sense of the world. It's mm. um, just the way I make sense of everything. Um, mm. Yeah. It's so interesting that word, you know, self-consciousness, because I, I was, I've always been quite self-conscious as well and shy. And I just found like being in nature, like eradicates that self-consciousness because it dissolves the self and you're suddenly part of something so much bigger than the self. And that's one of the things I love about being immersed in nature, all that self-consciousness just melts away. Did you, do you find that as well? Well, you do write so powerfully about that, about that dissolution of the whirring thoughts and the whirring self and the, like the painfulness of the self dissolves as well i i completely i resonate um that resonates so much with me and i think that's for me one of the most powerful parts mm. of being in nature is um just being part of something so much bigger um you mm. know being in the sea and feeling kind of tossed around by the waves and, and yeah. feeling yourself yeah. and you know now I know from from my research that it's like the default uh, mode network of the brain which is the area you know associated with the sense of self and the rumination and brooding it's which quietens yeah. in the mm. natural world which is also you know what alcohol and other things like that um right do, yeah. do for people so I think it's, it's quite a similar relationship um mm. uh so oh, I wish that we, I wish I could ask you questions, Anita, because I'd love to hear about your, uh, more about you. <laughs> Maybe one no, day no, we'll be able to all, meet again. Or... I hope we can talk again, but this is absolutely all about you. And I have like a million more questions to ask. And 
it's astonishing that we have to condense like hundreds and thousands of years of your research and your amazing life into an hour. But before, in the minute we have that, I wanted to ask about what next, looking into your own future, what you're working on now. Yeah. If I'm you just, can, give us a um, sneak preview. Yeah, I've been working on a really exciting book um, with, um, with a great guy called Kenneth Greenway, who's a forest school ranger, and it's about oh, um, yeah. nature and children. So I've, I've been whiling oh, away on yeah. that. Um, yeah. And I'm also very interested in um, uh, early motherhood and the madness of early motherhood. Um, mm. So I think uh, I'm looking into that. Um, uh, that's yeah in terms of writing um in terms of nature and nature discovery i'm obsessed with moss at the moment i'm going out and collecting me too moss. i'm absolutely oh, obsessed with it's the most oh. magical substance and also the fact that it grows on pretty much anything and everywhere like moss is a survivor and being northern i was amazed to discover that moss is northern growing it grows in, on the north side of things yeah Oh, I love Three that. Chairs. I didn't know that. Have you read um Have you read Gathering Moss by Gathering, Gathering Moss? Yeah, absolutely love yeah, it. Yeah. Absolutely love it, yeah. So you're it's writing so, more about your research and more about moss at the moment. Yeah, I'm just obsessed with yeah. it. I'm just um, bringing, I'm bringing it in and putting it in yeah. Tupperware, drawing it out and then Amazing. covering yeah. it in water and watching it come back to life. Um yeah, that's cool. We should Fantastic. go on a moss adventure one day or something. <laughs> we should. And if we should absolutely in person when all this pandemic is over. And if not, let's can we do a virtual moss tour? A virtual let's moss session. Let's like pitch let's... this to Kendall Festival, like a special moss set moss session. <laughs> let's do it. Because wow. like you say, it is everywhere, you know, you go outside and once yeah. you start noticing it, you know, it's in all the cracks mm. and all the I love it when it's in yeah. the, the words on graves and stuff. You get it in the little letters. Yeah. Um, Moss Appreciation Society. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Well, on that note, I'm getting the signal, unfortunately. I, I just flown by. Um, but thank you, Lucy, for an absolutely fascinating discussion. And you've truly whetted our appetite for what you're working on next as well. Um, but thank you so much for sharing your amazing, beautiful, brilliantly researched book and such an inspiring, powerful personal story as well, combined with truly universal topic. And, um, and I hope to interview you in the not too distant future about moss and motherhood and so on. And thank you so much to everybody listening for joining us um today um from all around the world sorry that we can't be with you in person but i hope one fine day that might be possible and please join me in giving a virtual round of applause to the wonderful lucy jones and do go out and buy we well, can't go out just yet but um do buy copies of her fantastic book losing eden for all your friends and family uh, christmas is around the corner and i'd recommend thrusting this book into the hands of every human being because it's such an important topic. So thank you, Lucy. And thank, thank you so, so much, much again to the sponsors and the festival. Thank you.